Well, the look of the creature was created by Millicent Patrick. She was a gal that worked over at uh, Universal and did a lot of designs for different films and stuff. And she actually came up with this, this little fella here. I think it was kind of her dream child. She loved him. It looked exactly like her sketches. I have a special interest in Millicent Patrick mostly because she has been rendered so invisible by time. Uh, she clearly had a lot to do with sketching the concepts for the creature. Uh, all versions, she went on tour to promote the movie when it first came out because she was so photogenic. And she was such an, a good interview subject and she was so talented. And uh, I get the impression that her contribution was kind of buried by Bud Westmore. Westmore's construction team, headed by Jack Kevan and Chris Mueller, made full body molds of both actors on which they built a flexible exterior shell. And then they had different sculptors. They had a crew of about nine guys that all worked. And one guy would work on the chest part, one guy would work on the arms. Because, I mean, there's a lot of work here. One sculptor just couldn't do all of this. As far as the head goes, it was sculpted by Chris Mueller, a very fine sculptor. But I've always given credit to the person that put me together from the inception to the back lot, Jack Keevan. And I just feel that Jack Keevan never got the recognition that he should have because he was kind of overshadowed by Bud Westmore. This particular head is one of the last castings out of the Ben Chapman mold, the land creature mold. And then my friend Bill Malone actually built and just reconstructed this whole suit. And it's exactly, I mean, almost every scale is where the actual suit was. Ben Chapman was here and thought this was one of his suits. I mean, it fooled him totally. The Creature from the Black Lagoon suit is a one big one-piece body stocking where they sculpted everything and put it onto the suit. And I, I had to watch my weight because I couldn't gain weight or lose weight because then it would fold. So it, actually, it took me two to three hours to get in and out because it has to be put in exactly right. They put me in a leotard. Um, uh, full bodied and uh, then they would paint glue on the leotard and put pieces of, of uh, foam rubber that was molded to see the texture of skin this uh, creature would have on it and sometimes when they would put the glue on it would go through the leotard and it would s start setting up and get very hot and it would burn me in several places I still have a little scar from one of them well the underwater suit was different from this one mainly because uh, Rico Browning was a lot smaller so the whole suit was built in smaller scale. They used pieces of this suit and scaled it down. In fact, you'll see this part in here. Well, on Rico's suit, that part isn't there. It's put together because he was smaller. Now, you never see them together, so you never see that. There are slight differences in the head, too, because like Chris said, when he was sculpting it, uh, both their heads were totally Di different configurations, you know, uh, like Ben's head was, was more round, I think, and, and maybe Rico's might have been more oval or, or which way. And so he had trouble getting the same end result, but it worked very close. And as long as you didn't see them together, you never, you never saw it. But it's all foam rubber so they could get, you know, movement out of it if they needed. They had a special head that they made up that made the gills flex when they were, when he was sitting, you'd see this that kind of a thing, which they ran tubes up and, and had compressed air hitting in these things. They had bladders and they would actually come out, but that was just for a head for that one shot where you saw him. They were originally going to build it so that I could wear uh, a face mask, but when we attempted to do that, we found out the face mask stuck out much too far and you couldn't do it. And then we talked about using uh, swimming goggles, you know, like this. I stopped that mainly because uh, you, when you have the goggles on inside the head and water gets in, you have no way of getting the water out of the goggles. So I chose not to have anything on and just shoot it with uh, your bare eyes, so to speak. Although some special publicity photos featured a brightly colored creature, the actual suit was much less flamboyant. Well, the original creature was this uh, sort of a s soft moss green, a very, very subtle color so that it picked up shadows and and it had the feeling of, of reality, of flesh really being there. And most of the recreations are too bright. They're, they're much too vivid a green, and as you say, sometimes, and sometimes the lips are red, and uh, it's, uh, they're garish compared to the original. In addition to the creature's elaborate costume, the film featured another eye-catching piece of specially constructed apparel, the heroine's bathing suit. Well, they wanted it to be a unique bathing suit. 
they didn't want to go to the store and buy one. And it was rather racy for its day because it was pulled up a bit at the thigh here. Now it's so tame, of course, but uh, so that it had its its own look. And it was always very difficult to get it to get it on every day with the body makeup, so the body makeup didn't get on the whites. Naturally, they made three or four. The underwater scenes were supervised on location by James C. Havens, while the Hollywood unit was personally directed by Jack Arnold. I had a lot of respect for Jack. We wound up the best of friends. But he was a tough director, a no-nonsense director. When I first got the part, I went up to Jack and I said, uh, how do you want me to play him? He said, the only thing I don't want you to do is don't make a cartoon out of him. You know, clump, clump, clump. And he said, no, I don't want you to walk. I want you to kind of glide, because remember, he, he's a, a fish, he comes out of the water. So we want you to kind of glide. So one day I came into the studio and he said, Ben, I solved your problems. I said, how's that? Underneath of my boots that I used to put on, they had attached 10 pound weights flattened out. Although production went smoothly for both units, there were some minor mishaps caused by the creature costume's restricted field of vision. I was carrying Julie in my arms through this cave. And, and she was, you know, slung over my arms with her head down. And I couldn't see where I was going, and clunk, I went wide into one of these artificial rocks. And I had no idea what happened. She started kicking, and, the end, and they were yelling, cut. I can't say I was truly injured, but it gave me a bit of a start. You know, first of all, I'm freezing cold, trying not to, trying not to have goosebumps and the bump. There's a famous picture that, that appeared in the newspaper of uh, Dick Carlson, Dick Sanning, myself. Jack Arnold and a nurse patching her up. We took a couple of hours off and Julie was ready to go again, you know, put a little makeup on it. But she was a very professional lady. When Creature from the Black Lagoon was released in 1954, even the most die-hard classic monster fans were impressed. Yeah, I didn't know what the creature was. I mean, I, I saw pictures of it. It looked like a neat monster guy. But I had no idea what I was really going to see. And when I went to see the creature, it was the days you could stay in the theater all day. I think I stayed there and saw it four times in a row. Creature's highly dramatic musical score contributed materially to the film's success. In addition to library themes, original music was provided by three composers, Henry Mancini, Hans J. Salter, and Hermann Stein. Science fiction films have, have a requirement that romances don't have and crime melodramas don't have, and that is that you have to kind of get suckered into believing that these ridiculous events can actually be taking place. There, there is no link between man and fish, but you watch Creature from the Black Lagoon and you're convinced that, yes, yeah, somehow this, this happened. And you don't think about these things generally because the stories are well written, but you also don't think about these things because you get emotionally involved in the pictures. And emotional involvement comes in a large part in these films due to the music. <laughs> One thing it has which sets it apart from most of the other pictures is it has a theme that is just beaten to death. You can hardly get a single view of them without the theme sounding, and I think it sounds about 130 times in the picture. The other reason why there's a lot of music in Creature from the Black Lagoon is because there's a lot of scenes without dialogue and sound effects, and that's because a lot of the scenes take place underwater. And nobody wants to listen to bubbles for 20 minutes. So instead, we get wonderful music there. While dramatically effective, the use of a composite score was not the preferred method of working for most composers. And the composers were against this form of scoring. This is a very primitive form of scoring, going back to really the beginning of film music in the, in the 30s. But they were obviously told from on high, if you know, you're scoring this picture and we want to hear the creature theme every time. So they no doubt grumbled a little and they did their job. And their job was to incorporate this very intrusive theme. It's not very musical, it's a very strident theme played on uh, fluttered tongue trumpets, which is really gets to your gut there, but they had to somehow incorporate that into their music every time they saw the creature. 
the composers were rather typecast, even at this early stage of their careers. Henry Mancini, even at this early stage, was, was known to be the person who wrote light music, not light in the standpoint of not good and not complex. He was a fabulous writer right from the start. But he wrote romantic melodies. He wrote playful melodies. Uh, Herman Stein was kind of a jack of all trades. Herman got main titles and end titles. Uh, he also got uh, a lot of scenes that were devoid of dialogue and uh, sound effects. He did the great swimming sequence with Julia Adams and the creature. They would give Hans Salter the horror sequences. So Hans scored a lot of the end of the picture when the creature is attacking. Get back, Kate. Get back. <laughs> What I like about Creature's score is it is, it's a marvelous patch job of a score. Uh, it takes music from horror films of the 40s like The Wolfman and Ghost of Frankenstein. It takes westerns like the James Stewart Bend of the River. It takes all of these disparate elements, combines them with original music, and somehow shuffles them together, re-records them, and makes this score unlike any of the other universal horror sci-fi pictures. And uh, I, I kind of like the way everything somehow hangs together. Everyone thinks they watch it and they hear their favorite creature music. And they're always shocked when they find out, well, no, this music was originally written to accompany a scene where a doctor is curing a sick horse. One of the film's most memorable sequences is the provocative pas de deux between Julie Adams and her underwater admirer. It is one of those, those concepts, one of those images that is on the surface rather straightforward. He's curious, he's observing, he's in his natural element. There's a different shape up there that I haven't seen before. Uh, perfectly simple and straightforward, but at the same time, it carries with it overtones, connotations, implications. And a number of authors have talked about how sexual this exchange is. I was eight years old in 1954 when this movie played in theaters. And I must have thought about its sexual content because I remember thinking to myself when Julia Adams first jumps into the water and we see the view of her from below and she's backlit by the light that's filtering through the, through the water and she could be completely nude. A fellow named John Baxter correctly pointed out years and years ago in a book called Science Fiction and Cinema, he said it was a stylized representation of sexual intercourse and he's absolutely correct. Uh, Jack Arnold, told me this was correct. But it's done on a very subliminal level. It's not, it's not as overt as many film historians would like us to believe. It is like a love dance. And, and you feel his, his heart, that, uh, that he's falling in love with this, uh, with this creature who's swimming on top of the water and swimming here, and he looks and so on. So it's really a love scene. What's important for the viewer is not so much that this is some sort of sexual interplay between the creature and this woman of a completely different species. It's the idea that for the viewer, this subtext connects and makes the creature's affection for her seem palpable. And as long as one doesn't stop to think about the logic of it uh, and is propelled by the action of the film from that point on, and we're left breathless and logic doesn't enter into it at all. But because we linger, the longer we linger, the more overtones it seems capable of, of holding for us. And because he is swimming in, in a kind of matched action with hers, it's like a mirror reflection. You can't help but think that the creature is some embodiment of instinct, of force, and it's under the surface of the of the civilized modern humans. Um, it's lurking there while the, the calm, placid movement continues on the surface. Jack Arnold often inserted subtle social commentary into his films, and Creature displays intriguing clues of a burgeoning environmentalism. There's, there's a so very surprising, to me it was a very surprising shot in the film where we see the heroine simply standing on the deck of the boat, waiting for something and finishing a cigarette. And then she takes her cigarette and just tosses it into the water. 
I don't know how I would have reacted to that in 1954. I probably would have taken it for granted. Of course, this is what everybody does. Just toss your cigarettes wherever you want. But I look at that now, and I think, go pick that up. <laughs> <laughs>